I'm trying something different this time, and I would love feedback to see if you think this is valuable and a helpful way to learn things. Uh, so mainly, what's interesting is when I came to Elixir, you know, you come from a lot of different backgrounds. You know, most of us didn't come to Elixir as our first programming language. So we're coming from Ruby or Java or, or we're coming from Python, a lot of these different languages. And with that, yeah, come on in, John. So with that, we are getting, we're bringing a lot of context with us of how we think about programming. And some of those things can, some of those things can hinder us, and some of those things we're leaning on, and they're making us productive. So what is the one thing that people could really use in Elixir that they're not currently using? And do you guys have any thoughts on like, oh, it's, you know, I, you've been doing Elixir, a lot of you have been doing Elixir currently, and some of you are kind of new to it, just hearing from what you're discussing about Christmas break. So in my view, it's processes. That processes are this incredible thing that's built in to the Erlang Beam and the VM. And uh, we can get a long way as a developer without even really understanding them. And really that's because um, that's because Elixir uh, with Phoenix and Ecto, they understand processes and how those libraries are built. So we are benefiting just by using them. As, in, as a, for instance, like if you're coming from Ruby and Rails, uh, with Rails, a, every request that comes in has to, is, is handled by an instance of your web server. And it, you have to wait for the whole request and response before the next request can be handled. So with uh, Phoenix, Phoenix is already creating a new process to handle every request as it comes in. So you're automatically better off than Rails in terms of what you can handle in concurrency. But we're still not using processes a lot of times ourselves and like as part of our design and our thinking. So Joe Armstrong, he's one of the creators of uh, Erlang and Elixir is, uh, they share the same ancestry. So Elixir is built on Erlang. And he says, we should think of processes like people. So what I hope you will leave with from the end of this presentation is you'll have a way of thinking about processes that makes more sense to you. Uh, an understanding of the basics of working with processes, and then beginning to start to think about how do I design my systems using processes. So first, we need some data, okay? So I need you guys to help me out. I'm gonna pass around some cards, hope you got some pens, or you can borrow a neighbor's pen. I don't know how many we're gonna need, there's probably plenty. So I can start, we'll start on both sides. Here you go. And all you got to do is write your first name on the card. Just your first name. We don't need anything else. Don't no social security numbers, driver's license, nothing like that. So just your first name, and and then we'll pass them all and collect all the the cards. And please uh, be ready and willing to volunteer. So this is going to be a little bit more interactive, a little less code heavy, because we're trying to get the concepts correct. So first, how do we think about a process? So well, if we have a process, so I'm gonna need one volunteer right now. Just one person and you're not gonna be embarrassed. All right, hey David, come on up. All right, so let me grab. Yeah, you can let you finish that first. Okay, so. Um, what, so if we think about a process as a person, so David here, here's our process. And we think about, well, what are the characteristics of a person? Well, he has state in his mind, what he's currently thinking about, what's currently in his mind. <laughs> and he's, and, uh, and I don't know what he's thinking about. And, and, <laughs> and, 
And, and he doesn't have any way of, so there's no way that I can find out unless, you know, am I going to interrogate him or something like that? What are you thinking about? <laughs> there will be a rubber hose. <laughs> but I think it's a lot easier for me to just ask you, what are you thinking about? Right? So I've got, uh, I'm going to try and. about state processes. Right. So right now, I'm going to send you a message that I would like you to think about something different. Oh, okay. Okay? So I'm going to send you a message that says, pick a number from 0 to 100. So, and keep that in your mind. Just something you can hold on to for a little, few minutes. All right, so he's, you got it? Got it. All right. 42. <laughs> 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 All right, so, now, is it 42? I don't want All right, pick a new one. All right. <laughs> pick a new number. <laughs> something that I wouldn't know, right? Okay, got it. You got one? Got it. Okay. So the idea is, is this state is private. I don't know what it is. And the best way for me to find out what that value is, is to ask him. So I'm going to send a message <laughs> saying, what is it? It's 34. 34. Okay. Now, what you can do, just to kind of complete the example, why don't you tell me what that message, that value is by writing it down. All right, and passing it back to me. All right, thank you. So now I have the number. All right now I know what he's thinking about. I have a, a little snapshot of his state. So I got to ask you though, what happens if I send him this again? New Take a new number. Okay. You got a new one? I do. All right. Did this just change? Did that just change? No, right? Because like, if it did, that would be by reference. right? I'd have a copy of his memory by reference. That's what we're doing with object-oriented stuff all the time and procedural stuff. We're passing on references. right? That's terrible. Eww, it doesn't work that way in the world. Uh, so what's, what's interesting is, so this is now, is it the, I guess the other question is, is it still true? Right? Well, it's not a reflection of his current state, but it is true that it, this was the state that he had at one point in time. So what I can also say about this is if he is a process, what I was doing is sending him a message that has a, some type of command or request, and he, he received the message. And what happens if you choose not to receive it? <laughs> right, like it's just, I can send it. Right, but it's it doesn't. He's not going to do anything with it. Right. So what we're talking about then is these cards represent a message that I'm sending to a process. That's the only way I communicate with the process is through messages. And when I get a message back, like his answer, this is immutable. I can't change this. If I if I were to somehow be able to change this number, that wouldn't change what was in his mind. Right. This is a copy of what was in his mind at that point in time. And so, does that make sense? Does anyone have a question? Yeah. Also, it may just be what he decides to tell you. It doesn't necessarily have to reflect his own state, right? Right. Well, it was 42, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, and it's not a, a full picture of his state, all the things that are in his mind. It's just that one little piece that I was asking about, right? So, but what's interesting is that's, this is intuitive, right? This is how our world works. We, we deal with people, right? We are a social, uh, a social race, you know, we, it's community, it's communication. That's how we interact is through sending messages and getting responses. And that's our natural way. And so let's take, oh, thank you, David. <laughs> so just to look at it in a slightly different way. So if I have two processes, and like this is me, I have something in my head, I don't know what's in his head, so I send him a message. What's on your mind? And he sends back, oh, this is what I'm currently thinking about. And I say, okay, great. So, what's that? The first three letters of the alphabet. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's always what I'm thinking about. <laughs> but what's interesting though is um, when you talk about threading, and we talk about mutexes and and the normal kind of programming way, it kind of looks like this. 
Ah! <laughs> right? It's, it's completely unnatural. <laughs> and, and, like, and what's interesting, though, is like, so then you talk about what's a mutex? A mutex is the straight jacket you put on, on this guy so that this one can move and do stuff and modify the state. And then when it's time to switch, it's like, oh, straight jacket on this guy, mutex, switch over to the other guy. Okay, now I can do stuff and modify state. Like that, no wonder it's kind of hard to understand it, right? No wonder. So processes, they really model the real world about how we actually interact. So any questions before we jump into the next piece? You guys all with me? All right. So now we're going to do another example. So I need one more volunteer. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Am I standing up? You can stay sitting right there, actually. So this one, I'm going to ask Dennis to, can we get the cards all passed around? So now we've got someone who we need to process this data that we've been generating. So I'll just give this to you as a little key to help you out. Yes, yeah, so let's collect all of these. Thank you. Thanks. Is anyone else? Okay. Great. All right, so these are fairly random. I don't think you guys sat alphabetically and handed them in that way, right? So what we're going to do is, this, in this example, we have one process, and he's going to do this task. The task is really simple. We can look at the instructions. So he's, he's got, well, yeah, I, can, I have to give you a copy of your instructions, sir. Here it is. There, so he's got a copy of his instructions, so he doesn't have to look up at the screen. But it's basically, he's going to take a card, take a name card, look at the first letter of the name in this one, it's A, and then he's going to decide, you know, do very light processing on it, and if it's A through M, he's going to speak out a special welcome to and the name. So some of these names... Yeah, I'm just going to say Junior. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know who it is. All right, so, so if it's an A through M, then it's a special welcome to Junior, right? That, his name's A. <laughs> and if it starts with N through Z, then you speak out, um, like, the next one would be Arter. Is that right? Arter? Cart? Oh, that's a C. Okay. Look like a hanging microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so Carter. Yes, sorry, sorry about that. So Carter, uh, if, well, let's, let's, Carter let's, say, let's say if it's Zach, right? <laughs> Carl with a Q, nice. <laughs> 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 Quincy, Chris Quincy. <laughs> so we got, say, say we got a Zach, right? So it's like, Zach, you rock. Okay, simple instructions. Everyone can see what we're doing. So if you want to just start processing these cards, Start going through that little flow. All right. So first is Carter. So a special welcome to Carter. A special welcome to CJ. A special welcome to Ashton. Scott, you rock. <laughs> a special welcome to Benz. Thanks. A special welcome to Josh. A special welcome to Gage. A special welcome to David. A special welcome to Brian. Right, we got a very fr front end heavy here. <laughs> a special welcome to John. A special welcome to Dennis. A special welcome to Jess. A special welcome to Evelyn. A special welcome to Landon. Ah, Nathan, you rock. A special welcome to Jake O. A special welcome to Kelsey. Reese, you rock. A special welcome to Jake, and another special welcome to Junior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, apparently. So I'm going to add a few more just to give us a distribution. <laughs> Quincy's got to get here, so. <laughs> well, thank you for doing that, David. Thank you. Dennis, Dennis sorry. No, we were no just talking about David. <laughs> um. <laughs> And I'll add Quincy in here too. There we go. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, let's get back. So now you think about it. If he is 
representing, like we're building a company, right? We've started this company and he's the one guy who's like doing everything. He's the sole proprietor, right? It's a do everything yourself uh, kind of e example here. And if that, was, if that was a business, would you say that that business would scale well? Not really. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna have problems. It's just not as efficient. But even when it's small, that's totally fine. Um, so, but if, if this were starting to grow as a business, and it's like, well, we're getting lots of names in, and they're coming in fast. And then, then you're saying, well, what do we need to do? We need to hire more people. And so, so let's just talk about coming back to programming a little bit. What might this special welcome and this you rock, what could those be in a program, right? It, one example is like, uh, we have a message that comes in that says, oh, we want to send a welcome email because they just signed up with our service. So that might be our welcome. You know, we're talking to an SMTP server. It's on a different machine. It's a service. There's some network latency. So the speaking part kind of represents that lag, that time to process. And if it's uh, you rock, hey, we're sending a, uh, an alert to someone's mobile device to say, hey, thumbs up, you rock, right? And that's something that, that might be going through Firebase or AWS. So we're, again, we're talking to something outside our system. Just in that communication, there's lag. So that's the speaking part is kind of like adding some lag for us. So if we were to take a look at, let's see. I'm just going to show you what that looks like when we run it in code. OK, so this is running an example in code. So we have a PID. This is the PID that's processing it. And it's color coded so that every PID will have a different color. But right now we see, oh, I had to look it up on the little list to see where, if that's a high or low alphabetic sort. And then a special welcome to that name. And it takes a little while, go through it all. All right, it took us about 30 seconds. Uh, and so that's not so bad. You know, when it's a small app, small user base, that's totally fine. So now we want to try when we add a little bit more concurrency. And I'm going to take a few more names just to mix it in. I think I'm going to take out, no offense to anyone whose names get pulled, but I'm just going to take out some of the, uh, some of the ones that are like this whole block of front-loaded alphabet stuff. Your parents, we got to have a talk. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to mix some of these in just kind of randomly. I don't know where. Okay, now I need two more volunteers. And Dennis, if you'd still be willing to help out. All right, come on up. We got one. We need one more. All right. You're sitting perfectly where you need to be. So I'll take these away from you. So we're going to see. Well, you actually need to be close to him. So you can, we can swing that around. So we're just going to see if we can take the same process, the same code, the same functions that we're calling, and we're going to refactor them. So we're going to try and refactoring it and breaking it out. And we've hired some people to help us with this. So. If you guys are good sports, you will put on our little name tags. So let's see. You are the welcomer. You are the sorter. Oh, it came undone. You are the rocker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 you need a sign for that. The <laughs> Bono and people don't want to put their <laughs> <laughs> name tag on. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> OK. And so you have a set of instructions. And we'll review them. Oh, wait, I gave you the wrong one. Sorry. Hot comes up. <laughs> <laughs> there's your instructions. So you don't have to do any of the reading now. So now you're just sorting. And this is just kind of helping you with that, that key to say, which way do I go? Right? 
So this is all it is, just like a little alphabet key in case someone struggled with where S was, you know, so you know which way to go. What's that? I just said I know I would. I'm surprised that's the I had to think about several words. Okay. This is a high process. Yeah, he's 10 to 3 in here. It goes totally against this analogy. All right, so we're just going to take a look at our refactored code. <laughs> yeah, it's like single threaded and everything. All right, so the refactored sorter is just saying, all right, I'm going to take a message from my mailbox, and that's the mailboxes. I have all the things. I, I have to give them to them. And then he's going to start processing them. And if it starts with an A, then he sorts it. And if he sorts, like, from A, Adam goes over here to the welcomer. So you want to read out, actually, yeah. He, the same thing that he was doing. Yeah. yeah, so the, the first step is... Wait for a message in your mailbox. Right, so he's going to sit there and do nothing until we send him a message to process. Okay. And then he's going to take the message out of the mailbox, and then he'll. He didn't have to worry about like. I, he always says the same thing. Right. You don't have to worry about oh which one do I say now. Right. You're only saying the one thing. And coming back over here to the rocker. Same thing. Just wait for one mess. Wait for a message. Take the message out and speak out loud the phrase, you rock. OK, so let's go ahead and do that. You guys ready? All right, I'm going to I'm sending all the messages over to you. All right. A special welcome to Jake. Reese, you rock. Quincy, you rock. A special welcome to Kelsey. Nathan, you rock. A special welcome to Jake O. Stacy, you rock. A special welcome to Landon. Todd, you rock. A special welcome to Evelyn. A special welcome to Josh. Scott, you rock. A special welcome to Vance. A special welcome to CJ. Zach, a special you rock. welcome to Ashley. Nice. A special welcome to Carter. A special welcome to Jess. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Do you have a company that does this? I'm, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. All right. So thank you, everyone, for your help. Appreciate that. And so now let's just take a. So one of the things that we noticed is it was faster. We I also I did adjust the the data so it's a little bit more balanced. But one of the other things that we see is that it was concurrent, right? The welcomer and the rocker can all speak at the same time. They can talk over each other. They're not waiting for the other person to finish. And he's sitting there sorting while the other people are speaking. So it's all of it's concurrent and it's happening in parallel. And that's just, it, that's, that's intuitively how our world works, right? If I just get more people, it's like, hey, can you do that job? You do that. That's, that's how it works. And so let's take a look at some Elixir code for what a sorter might look like. So the receive, that first, uh, the first one is wait for a message in your mailbox. So one, that's the receive, right? I'm going to sit there and wait for a message. And if I don't get a message, I'm just going to sit there and wait. As soon as a message comes in, then I'm going to take one message out, and I'm going to match it and say, oh, do I know what to do with this? Oh, I do. I'll, I'll process it. If I don't know what to do with it, like, so what if, you know, I, I handed him, it's like, hey, here's a plate of food, right? It's like, that does not match the pattern of what I'm supposed to be doing with the name, right? So he's just like, I'm just going to ignore that. So that's what happens down here. It's like, it was a message I don't know what to do with. I'm just nothing. But so I said, I know what to do with it. I'm going to regular expression match A through M. I'm going to send it to the other guy. So I'm sending a message to the other PID, uh, to the process. And I'm saying, say this name. I don't have to know what he's going to say. I'm just like, say this name. And that's the same way with the other one. And then recursively, we just stay in here. After I process one message, I go back in. So I'm just staying in that position. So let's talk, take a look at the welcomer. Same thing. I wait for a message to come in. Once a message comes in, I'll match it. Oh, I know what to do with that. And a special welcome to the person's name. And then recurse. So I just stay in that loop. Same with the, with the rock example. Right? So wait for it. Process it. You know, match it. You know, do, something, do something with it. Match it. And then process it. 
So let's take a look at a code example, like just execution of that. All right. So there's different colors. Everything has the same amount of delays, the same name list. And we're done. One more. There we go. So all the messages are sent to the sorter immediately. Then you start sorting them. And he, the sorting goes faster than the speaking, right? So like the speaking is sending emails, talking to external services. I can sort fast. Then the speaking, this process is green for the speaking. Adam, you rock. And down here, this one's purple. Special welcome to Zoe. And so these, are, these messages are kind of piling up on either side <coughs> to each person. So with that concurrency example, are there any questions? Yeah? Does that pattern of uh, the tail call to throw a function into the infinite loop, is that a common pattern? Yes. In, in Elixir, it's called tail recursion. And the, the Elixir and the, the beam, uh, same with uh, Erlang, too, it's optimized to actually treat that as a go-to. So it just goes to the top passing in the, 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 new the new information on the register. So it, it, you're never going to blow out a stack with, with that. It has to be the last call, though, of your function to be tail recursion. Does yeah. it have to be named, or is there a primitive for saying this function? No. Nope. There is. It has to be. Well, yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's Because you're, you're also having to pass in the new state, um, oftentimes because it's like you're building up. You know, it's like I, if I something was passed in to me, maybe a list of values, I'm going to process one and then pass in the remaining list. So it's like that, I am keep passing new state in. So you do have to name it so you can pass it. Can't think if you could do that anonymously. Yeah? So what did the receive keyword do with the name? The receive just takes a process and it sits and waits for a message to come to its mailbox. So in Elixir, the, in the Erlang be, beam, it is actually called a mailbox. So every process has a mailbox, and they'll sit there, and messages will pile up, and they'll process them one at a time. And yeah? Uh, just a follow-up question on the mailbox. Is there like an expiration on how long a message can sit in a mailbox? Nope. No. So it's the life of the process. As soon as the process dies, it goes away. Yeah. How do you handle like, um, back pressure? Each of those is a queue, I assume, of some kind, and some determined length. Mm -hmm. Can you fix that length, or what happens? When you know, do things fall off the end? When it gets too big? Um, it, can the sender block until there's room? Yes. So one way to do that is the sender can, instead of just throwing it off, which is uh, like a send, is the primitive. If you're also using gen servers, it's a cast. Uh, but you're sending something and not waiting for a response. You can imp uh, apply back pressure by saying, I'm going to wait for you to tell me you're done. So you can do that, but that makes it synchronous again. So there's other ways we can deal with that. What do you mean I'm done? Uh, so when I. So, so uh, like another way to send it. So I can. So if I were to say, <coughs> pass a message. All right, passing him the message 34, right? So did you get the number? Yes. Okay. And what is the number? 34. OK, thank you. That simple example is how, our, how we work. And, and so the idea is I have to ask him again. Are you done with that? Did you get that? So if you're doing like just a, a send, which is the primitive way to do it, like this, the smallest, easiest way, if I'm just doing a send, then, I, then I, if I want to know that you're ready for more or anything, I have to ask you. Are you ready for more? So you're not using the queue basically at that point? Right. Okay. Yeah, and mm -hmm. sorry, probably a little too advanced, but there is like gen stage that does solve a lot of those problems. Yes. I mean, but essentially, what's doing is converting the flow where like like someone asks for a batch of work, mm -hmm. and then you have multiple people asking for batches of work, and so like because it goes backwards, you never like have piling up queues. You just have like you know this work, and these providers that provide work, and then whenever. Yes. Exactly. And they're called consumers. Yeah, so the consumers, you can have like a pool of them all attached, so like, uh, if, especially if it's an expensive operation that takes like a second to, to do, then they're all saying, hey, do you got any more work for me? 
and it works that way. So they're pulling the data down. So the, what, ha, what that means is that the source, the producer of that data, has to be able to cache up enough. And so then that's you know, performance tuning, right? Do I have enough consumers? But yeah, thank you. Any other questions? OK. So just to review, a process is like a person. They have private state. They send messages. Messages are immutable. And we receive messages from our mailbox, and you ignore what you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, so with concurrency, just to review that, more people means more processes. More processes, we scale better. And concurrency is actually intuitive when we think about how our world works. And it's how everything works around us, you know, you're, the, the cars that are driving next to you on the road. Right? They're all independent, it's parallel, concurrent stuff. You're having to be aware of them, right? So what's fun about doing this is like, when I started doing Elixir, this is the stuff I wish someone could have explained to me. It, you know, it, it didn't take very long to kind of get the basics of the, the syntax, right? Oh, I see, a with statement. I know what I can do with that. Oh, it's uh, pipes. Oh, I love pipes, those are so awesome. Pattern matches, right? It's like, we get all that pretty quick, and it, even, you know, even if we're struggling with some of that, it, we get it. it. But it's processes that are really different because they don't match most of what we've come from with other, other programming languages. I've seen a lot of developers being very productive, creating Phoenix applications, and, but basically they're creating sole proprietors, right? And that's not all bad, but I think we can do better. And so just the idea is to start thinking about how can I, when I, you have a system, right? You have this, the code that you work on. You have the side project, right? It's like, okay, normally you would think like in object-oriented terms, like, oh, I have this object and this object, but that's still all your, it's single-threaded kind of a thing. It's all one process executing it. So I just want you to encourage you to start thinking about Hey, if I were to hire somebody else in this system, if I were to think about my system as a company of people, you know, back before the days of computers, right? It's like paper office. That was the thing, right? Paper. And that was sending messages. Here, I got a new version of this data. Can you process that now? If you start thinking about how does, how does my system, what would that look like if it were actually people? And then where could I start hiring more people to make things more efficient? So the only other thing I was going to mention is, so that little system we built with Dennis and John and what was your name? Benz. Benz? All right, thank you. Um, it, that was like the best, most coolest system ever, right? Like if that was a company, that would be awesome, right? But then what happens when, uh, you know, Benz loses his voice? I'm sorry, Benz. If he loses his voice, right, or, or John just like, ah, heart attack, I died, right, <laughs> then everything falls apart. So like, it's in some of the real ways that that happens, like we have an email server. What if someone changed the, the credentials to log into that email server? To that? And so like now uh, I can't send messages, I can't do my job. Right or the network interruption, I can't get to the email server, or the serv the SMTP service isn't even running; it's crashed. Right? There are all these weird ways that things can go wrong, and that's where you know next time, if this has been interesting and valuable as a, in a learning approach, then then we can talk more about like introducing supervisors and what their actual role is. But for now, I just wanted to get you guys started. So you guys can realize, yes, you can do this. It's not that hard. So what I also, like for the examples, there were little videos, right? Um, I put them into a, a GitHub project. I can post it to the Meetup page too. But you can download that, clone it, whatever, and just start playing with it. And like that, it has the way of, you know, you can see the, how the receive works. You can play with it. You can try the send, play with it. And then, you know, that's the start, right? We have to first start thinking about our systems 
as people because we can imagine that, right? I can imagine, oh, okay, well, what if I did have someone who I could say, yeah, yeah can you send out this email? And I'm going to keep going on with my work. Oh, yeah, can you send this notification to them, to the user? And if I can start thinking about it that way, then it's like, oh, well, I can design that in Elixir. That's totally cool. So I just want to uh, thank you guys for, yes? Can we talk a little bit about the economy of processes and message passing? The processes are efficient. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's. Uh, so I'll just. Any other questions before we can? I'd be happy what to talk about that. Already? No. No. So I was just gonna. I, I'm. I'm wrapping up. So we're done here. Is there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you everyone for your time and, and involvement. All right. Yeah. So, did you want to? Talk about what, what was it you were thinking about with? Well, I was just saying, you know, we're talking about how this works and you get these processes, but because of being and um, mm. playing, processes are really, really efficient. Yes. You told me, I think yesterday you can run 100,000 processes on a little laptop and old. Yeah, laptop. hundreds of thousands. Hundreds They're of thousands. super cheap. So, you know, the, but the expense comes in the message passes <laughs> with the state when you have a mutable state pushing around. So yeah. So, one thing we can. When you're planning this out, you're understanding what the economy of. Yeah, so one of the things is like in David's example, like when he wrote this down, he was creating a copy, right? So he has to create a copy to send that out. So it's a deep copy too. When, and so just being aware of like if I have a huge message, it's like, oh, here's complete works of Shakespeare, right? I'm going to send that to you. It's like, well, maybe I can send it in a different way. Right? Maybe I don't have to keep that all in my process. Yeah. Oh, I thought it's so, okay. Yeah, so what exactly makes them so much cheaper than other languages? What, what is it that makes it so possible? Yeah, so what happens is, uh, say you have like a quad-core laptop, right? The beam is creating a, an OS thread per core, and then it's by default. You can tune it and obviously change it to be something other than that. But you can say, yes, take all advantage of all the cores, create a thread per core, and then it's running its own scheduler. So the Beam has its own scheduler, and it's giving all these little time slices to these processes, and they're just sending messages. And you're, because you have immutable data, it actually can be cheaper uh, to copy because it's like, well, you didn't modify anything. Uh, so I can keep like, you know, what if it was 34A? So I added A to the end, right? I, I it's a I'm able to keep like a reference copy to what I had before in memory for like, like I didn't have to create a new piece of paper to say 34A. So it's, it's more efficient that way just in, it, with immutable data for, yeah. So, so if I understand right, what you were just saying, um, within a process, you can, you know, like if you add an element to a list, you can have the same reference to that entire list plus one. Yeah. But if you're going across processes, it's a deep copy, and, and, and it's completely new space and memory that you would have to store. Yes. And a lot of that has to do with another benefit of the beam. So there's, there's the pro and con, right? Uh, the pro is I don't have to, like, do a global interpreter lock and freeze everything while I clean up memory because the memory exists with the person. It's, in, it's the state, right? When that person dies, the state's gone. That's when you clean it up. It's only when you have really long running processes, you know, like Methuselah or somebody, where you have to pause and then the beam can pause a single process and do a garbage collection on it. But for the m most part, you don't have to worry about it because processes are pretty short lived. Yeah? That was one of the things that I didn't understand. Well, in normal Unix system work, forks are extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. You're copying the entire memory space of one process into another. You're doubling your memory. Mm. I mean, unless there's copy on right. But as soon as you touch something, now you, you know, you've blown it. So um, that, that, the, the beam gets its own, I mean, it has its own data structures and everything. Like So it doesn't have nearly the overhead that the OS work does. Right. You know, it's conceptually the same thing. Yeah. The price is just not there. It's really cool stuff. Also, I mean, one reason it is deep copy is because you can take that process and put it on an entirely different server. Yes. And it just like creates those hard boundaries that allow you to scale in a distributed way a lot easier. 
Mm -hmm. That's one reason. Yes, yes. Like when it when it crosses to another, like I'm sending a message to another machine, physical machine. Yeah, I, it has to be a deep copy to have it over there. I think maybe talks to that point a little bit. Your example of the mutex and the shared brain. This is getting around that. That's really what's happening. Is you've got different threads or processes, literally a host of processes running. And when you move data between the processes, rather than having a mutex that blocks that data as the message is passed across, it's just cop making a duplicate of data, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second guy just has now a copy of it. Yep. That happens to be the same. Yes. Yeah, so it just makes, you don't have to worry about, yeah, so it's just the way you get the data in and out is through messages. And that's really how it all comes down to. So it's start playing with messages, right? Have you done any benchmarking comparing that performance over it? I think you and I have talked about this before. But just doing a process data movement versus in-process data movement, like between functions, like you have a big object of data. Mm -hmm. Object, right? Sorry, a big chunk of data. <laughs> <laughs> and you wanted to move it between functions, and how many, how much overhead does that take versus moving it between processes? Be worth benchmarking. Yes, so we, uh, moving it through functions, so that's something we can talk about another time, is a function, it, it's kind of hard to, coming from an object oriented way, world view, where you say this method belongs to that class. I can't call it by itself because it's referencing things that belong to the, that are hidden to that class. I can't do that. But with functional programming, uh, you can. It's just a function. So it's a question of who is the process that is executing that function. You know, we have the same people, same processes. I could swap their code. And it's just a different set of instructions, but this, the process is executing those instructions. So when a single process is processing a large chunk of data through a whole bunch of functions, there's no copying or overhead of like, you know, copying the data, because it's not going to a different process. It's only when I'm, you know, what I could do with that big chunk of data is I could break off a piece and send that to this process. Okay, go work on that. You go work on that. You go work on that. And then assemble all of it back together. So that's another way to approach that. Well, thank you guys. Thanks, I appreciate it.